Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 1050, College Algebra for Students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'm your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. In this video, I want to talk about quadratic inequalities. Much of chapter three has been involving quadratic functions and quadratic equations, but as often as necessary, we switch over to inequalities. Now, when we're trying to solve inequalities, the technique I always suggest is that we actually begin by solving the equation. So if you want to solve a quadratic inequality like x squared minus 4x minus 12 is less than 0, I would first begin by solving the equation x squared minus 4x minus 12 equals 0. And then we solve the equation uh, like we would any other quadratic equation. We could complete the square, we could use the quadratic formula, or in this case, a very simple factorization is possible here, right? Because we need factors of negative 12 that add up to be negative 4. And so we can get away with having x minus 6 and x plus 2. Notice that negative 6 times 2 is negative 12, but negative 6 plus 2 is negative 4. And so this gives us two markers, x is equal to 6 or negative 2. Now these markers are not necessarily the solutions of the they're not necessarily solutions to inequalities, but they do help us understand what the solution looks like. These are the markers here. So what I would then do is I would draw a number line like you see illustrated here to the right. I would then mark off 6, x equals 6, and then x equals negative 2. I would mark these off. Now, looking at the linear inequality right here, we could pick a test point because we have different intervals. We want something less than 2, like maybe negative 3 something between negative 2 and 0, or negative 2 and 6, like 0. Or then you can have something bigger than 6, like maybe 10. And then you could try plugging these numbers into the original inequality and see what happens. If you get a true, like it, it passes, then that's part of the solution set. If not, then no. Now, personally, though, I don't like to do the test points. I actually just like to think of the graph. Like when I look at this, this quadratic function, I look at the leading coefficient. It's a positive 1. 1's your a value. And since it's positive one, it means it's going to concave upward. So if I were to draw this thing really quickly, I would get something like the following. I get a mark at negative two. I get a mark at six. And since the graph is concave upward, I'm going to get a picture that looks something like the following. Oh, no, that's a hideously drawn parabola. That's okay. I, it doesn't matter. Because if we're comparing our function to zero, if we want to be less than zero, that means we're looking for those points which are below the x-axis. If you're below the x-axis, you're talking about this region right here. And so then we would record that the solution set is going to be from negative 2 to 6 because we want those things below the x-axis. Because it's strictly less than 0, we do not include the markers. The x-intercepts will not belong to the solution set because, um, if, because at negative 2 for x or x being 6 that would show that you're equal to zero, but we have to be less than zero, so we get those things between them. Let's look at another example. Take 2x squared is greater than or equal to x plus 10. If I was solving an equation, I would set the right-hand side equal to zero. So we're gonna do that for our inequality as well. 2x squared minus x minus 10 is greater than or equal to zero. So I want to kind of stop us right here. What I already see is since this is greater than or equal to zero, I'm gonna be looking for those points which are above the x-axis when I'm done. And so also because of the leading coefficient right here, your a value is positive. Again, our graph is going to be concave upward. So if I were to graph this thing like so, I know that my function would look something like the following. It's concave up and we're going to get these two different x-intercepts. What are these x-intercepts? I don't know. That's why I have to solve the equation. So you solve the equation 2x squared minus x minus 10 equals 0. Again, you could solve this by... The quadratic formula, you could solve this by completing the square factoring, does work in this situation. Notice that if I take 2 times 10, 2 times negative 10, that's equal to negative 20, and I need factors of negative 20 that add to be negative 1, uh, you could do negative 5 and 4. So with these numbers in hand, we can then try to factor by groups, or you could try to do a guess and check approach. You get like 2x times x something. You could try that. I'm just going to factor by groups. So you're going to get 2x squared minus 5x. That's your first group. And then for your second group, you're going to get 4x minus 10. This is still equal to 0. 
From the first group, you can pull out a just a just an x, I guess, leaving behind 2x minus 5. From the second group, you can pull out a 2, leaving 2x minus 5. Those do match up. And so our factorization is going to look like 2x minus 5 and x plus 2 equals 0. That then tells us that our solutions are going to be x equals 5 halves and x equals negative 2, which we then could label on our graph right here, negative 2 and positive 5 halves, or 2.5 if you prefer. And so since we're looking for those things above the x-axis, we'd be grabbing this portion right here. This is this part, the y-coordinate is above the x-axis, and over here is also above the x-axis, as illustrated in our graph right here. So our solution set would look like the following. We get negative infinity up to negative 2. Now, do I include the marker or not? Since I'm going to be greater than or equal to 0, negative 2 will be included in that. So we get negative infinity up to negative 2, union, bracket, 5 halves to infinity, which again, we're going to include the endpoints negative 2 and 5 halves because we are equal, we're allowed equal to zero. And since we want greater than zero, that means we want those things above the x-axis. Well, how about this example, x squared plus 2x plus 1. If I try to solve this one by factoring, I'm actually going to discover that x squared plus 2x plus 1 actually factors as x plus 1 quantity squared, which is, should be greater than zero. And so as you see right here, this has a single x-intercept at negative 1. And because your leading coefficient is 1 and it's positive, or my graph is concave upward. And so you see, you get a picture that looks something like the following. You get a point on the x-axis, and then everything else is above the x-axis. If we're looking for those points, which are greater than 0, that would be grabbing this sector right here and this sector right here. So the y-coordinate is greater than 0 whenever x is not equal to 1. So your solution would actually look like negative infinity to negative 1 union negative 1 to infinity. And so you get the solution, uh, you get the solution uh, to be everything except for negative 1. Negative 1 feels really left out right now. It didn't get to be on the dodgeball team. Everything but negative 1 is a solution here. I do want to, and I want to show you that this, in this situation, if one were to calculate the discriminant here, you'll notice that the discriminant of this quadratic is actually equal to zero. And if your discriminant is equal to zero, you basically have only one of two pictures. So the first picture is kind of like we saw a moment ago. I'm going to put a little bit lower here. Your first picture, your parabola, its vertex is the x-intercept, so it looks something like this. This would be because your a value is positive and your concave up. Uh, and therefore, you get something like that. The other option is that your vertex is still on the x-axis, but then maybe the graph is concave down. So your a value is negative, and then your concave down. Personally, when I'm working with a quadratic inequality, I always want the leading coefficient to be positive. So if my leading coefficient was negative, I'd probably just times it by negative 1, uh, and then we'd just be done with it. So, so that, that is, you can always turn it into this type of problem, but if it is, it's, it's concave downward. If you were then asking yourselves, what's the solution look like if I'm greater than zero? Well, in this situation, since the we'll say that the vertex happens at h, if you're looking for your quadratic to be greater than zero, then your solution would look like negative infinity to h union h to infinity, like so. And if you also modified the problem so that you want f of x to be greater than or equal, I, I wrote, as I didn't write what I meant, we want f of x to be greater than zero. Sorry about that. If f of x was greater than zero, then you'd want everything above the x-axis. You get everything except for h. Let me actually write my h a little bit better here. Now, if you wanted, if you want this thing to be f of x is greater than or equal to zero, in that situation, you'd want everything to the left of the vertex, everything to the right. But since you could equal zero, then you could get the vertex itself. In that situation, your solution set would actually be all real numbers. Or you might th write that with the r right there. So all real numbers. On the other hand, if your graph was going downward, uh, we don't like I said, we don't even need the green picture. That's an option, but you can always flip it above. And so I'm going to focus just on this upward picture right here in yellow. 
Um, what happens if you looked at f of x is less than zero, like I accidentally wrote at the beginning? If you want the stuff that's less than zero, then you're gonna be grabbing this stuff down here, which there's nothing there. So we actually find out that the solution would be the empty set, AKA this thing right here. That doesn't seem so good. And that, I mean, it's possible. You, you might get no solution uh, if you want the things that are below. On the other hand, if you wanted like say, f of x is less than or equal to zero. That way you would, you would want everything that's below the x-axis, which is nothing, and everything that's on the x-axis, that would give you the interval of just h to h, which of course is just a single number, h itself. So these the discriminant equals zero case is sort of like an interesting duck here. It basically comes down to we get either, we, we get everything but the vertex, everything, nothing, or nothing but the vertex. These are the possibilities you get. Well, let's look at one last example here. Take x squared plus x plus one is greater than zero. I wanna mention that in this situation, the discriminant b squared minus four ac, if we look into that, we're gonna get one minus four, which is negative three, which as negative, this would mean that there's gonna be no x-intercepts on the graph. And since the leading coefficient is positive, we actually see, like you can see on the screen above, we would see that our graph would actually live entirely above the x-axis. Like so, so it never hits the x-axis. So what would our solution set look like? Well, if you want the things that are greater than zero, you want things above the x-axis, in that situation, f of x is greater than zero. What we would get, like we see here, is we want everything that's above the x-axis. That's everything, that's everything, that's everything. Our solution would be all real numbers, like so. Well, what if we ask the question, what if we want f of x to be greater than or equal to zero? So we would include the x-intercepts. Well, there are no x-intercepts, so that doesn't change the solution at all. It's still gonna be all real numbers. Now, on the other hand, if we wanted to ask the question, well, when is f of x less than zero? Like we see here, less than zero would be down here, but there's no part of the graph that lives there. We would again get nothing. This is the empty set. And if we switch to include the x-intercepts, so when f of x is less than or equal to zero, that is still the empty set because there's no x-intercepts to include. So the, the, discriminant, the negative discriminant case is even kind of weirder than the discriminant zero case that we saw before because when your discriminant is negative, it means that your function will be either entirely above the x-axis or entirely below. And that means your solutions can be all real numbers or no real numbers. You only get those two options, just flip of a coin basically. Now, because of these two kind of anomalous cases, the discriminant equals zero, discriminant equals negative, for the most part, I would probably have you practice with positive ones because that's where some interesting things happens. But be aware that these special cases are possibilities. And that's how one solves a quadratic inequality. If you can solve a quadratic equation and you have a basic idea of how to graph a quadratic equation, then you can put those principles together and solve a quadratic inequality.